It was a time of conflict in the community of faith, where some were insiders and others were outsiders. It was a time of division in community leadership, where political and religious authorities were mistrusted and discredited. It was a time when most common people were without power, a time when cultures clashed. And yet, it was a prosperous place, a Greek-speaking urban area with a large Jewish population. It is in this time and from this place that Matthew paints a portrait of the life and ministry of Jesus. Here we see Jesus facing division, ministering in the margins, demonstrating servant leadership, challenging allegiances, and widening the divine embrace more than many dared imagine. Here, in the pages of Matthew, we encounter the Messiah. Yet Jesus was not loud or demonstrative. His life and teaching simply drew people to follow him. He made history by starting in a humble place, in a spirit of love and acceptance, and allowing each person space to respond. His vision of life continues to challenge humanity. His influence continues to sweep over history. His teachings still lead us toward dignity, compassion, forgiveness, and hope, and challenge us to live the good news in our current culture and time. Encountering Jesus changes us. How will you encounter Jesus today? Hey, this is Donnie Barry. For those of you who don't know, for those of you who do know, uh, we sent Donnie and his wife Rebecca out with Training Leaders International uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, as one of our missionaries that we sent from Christian Fellowship. So we're super happy to have them back. Uh, so let's welcome Donnie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We also have uh, Amen and Jess are here, right back here. If you guys would stand real quick, we just want to welcome you. Amen and Jess are with a Celsi. Uh, ministry in Guatemala. And so for some of you might know John and Sharon Harvey, Amen and Jess have taken over a Celsius and are leading that ministry. Uh, so super uh, great time for us this week to have them in town. Uh, it's been, been wonderful. So, uh, so hey, so if you've read any of Donnie's newsletters about where he's traveled and where he's been, uh, he's talked about the fruit that people give to him and avocados uh, are a big deal. And so this is just a humble gift, Donnie, uh, to you. It's a small Missouri avocado, uh, nothing like the Brazilian ones that are 10 times bigger. Uh, but we just wanted to, to bless you and say we hope you're fruitful in ministry and all that good stuff. Thank yeah, you. So, okay, It's great. a special one, even if it is a pitiful little small thing. Oh, that's, that's so rude, pitiful. All right, let's, let's pray. Uh, stretch your hands out. We're going to pray over Donnie before he comes. Father, thanks for Donnie. Thank you for our friendship, uh, a friendship. In, in life, friendship in the gospel and in ministry. And uh, Father, we pray that he would be uh, blessed this morning as he speaks, that our hearts would be blessed as we receive from him that which he is bringing from you to impart to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It is so good to be with you. Uh, our family has enjoyed the last few days just being back. It's like coming home. And we are so grateful to be here. Of all the places I get to teach, this is my favorite. To, to come back to, to preach and teach my family, uh, the people that we know love us. So it's wonderful to be here. I want to show a picture quickly um, of a class in August. I was teaching a group of pastors in Liberia, uh, teaching them a class on the big story of the Bible, understanding how all the scripture is one story pointing to Jesus. If you've been around for very long, um, you know that's my favorite thing to teach on. And um, at the end of that class, these, uh, these brothers um, after the final exam, they all stayed around, and I'm like, it, it, we're done. The, when you're done with the final, you can go. No, we're going to stay just a little while, and they waited for everybody to finish, um, and then uh, they all stood up, and they said, we just want to thank you for coming, for what you have given us. It is, it is such a gift. It's a treasure, the, the knowledge of Christ you've brought, and they said, we're not just thanking you, though. We know your family is sacrificing so you can be here. Thank them for us, and we know there are many people that have sent you here, made it possible for you to come. Please thank them. And so I am just fulfilling that request because you guys are the people that have made it possible for us to go 
um, to, to share God's word with people around the world, equip pastors. It's because of your prayers, because of your generosity, because of all the love and support of you that we're able to do what we do. And so on behalf of our family, also on behalf of these brothers in Liberia, many others that I'm getting to work with, thank you for all your support, your partnership in the gospel. It is so wonderful to go out knowing we have such a strong um, support base, people who are with us in this, standing with us, and so we're really, really grateful for you. Um, And I'm excited to get to be part of this Matthew series this morning. As Rebecca and I went out um, with Training Leaders International just a little over a year ago, but our story began in 2004 uh, when we went to Guatemala with, uh, with Aselsi Ministries. We got to go on a mission trip that Christian Fellowship sent some mini- uh, a team down to, to meet John and Sharon Harvey, our missionaries there. And so I'm really thankful, not just to be part of the sermon series here, but to be here on a weekend when Amen and Jess are here, um, who are now leading that ministry that has such a special part in our lives, because it was on that trip John Harvey took me out into the mountains where he was teaching and training pastors because he knew I was interested in teaching the Bible. He said, you should come see what we're doing. And I fell in love with what he was doing. And that seed got planted in my heart. I said, that's what I want to do one day. And that's what led us to do what we're doing now with Training Leaders International. It all comes back to uh, the work in Guatemala that these guys are laboring to do. So it's, it's so special to be here with them um, and to get to share God's word with you this morning. So, um, so thank you for you, all the labor you guys are doing to train pastors and so many other things you're doing. What a neat ministry um, that we get to be a part of in Guatemala as well. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to, um, you can clap, you can clap. It's wonderful. God is at work in so many places and it's so wonderful that we're a part of it. Um, so uh, Matthew chapter nine is where we're going to be today. As Mike taught in the first sermon in this series on encountering Jesus in the gospel of Matthew, he talked about how Matthew was the gospel of fulfillment. Uh, Matthew understands that what has happened through Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is the fulfillment of all that God's been doing since before the creation of the world. All that unfolds in the Old Testament, in history, it, the spotlight falls on Jesus now. And we learn that the whole story has been about him. It's been aiming us toward him and leading us to him. And and this is the story Matthew's recording for us. And and it's a story, this grand God-authored story is a story about a king and his kingdom. It's beyond all the very best fairy tale kings and fairy tale kingdoms because this is the real one, the true one, the one we were made for, that our hearts long for. So 44 times Matthew refers to uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or the gospel of the kingdom. It's a major theme in this gospel. The king that we long for, the kingdom that we were made for, that's the story that Matthew's picking up. It's a story about uh, a king who created the world as his kingdom, put his image bearers in charge of it to rule and represent him, bringing his life, his good rule and reign, his blessing into all of creation. But it's also a story about rebellion in the kingdom and how um, his kingship was rejected, leading to death and brokenness and pain in creation. But God comes to reclaim what's his. That's what the story's about. God in his great heart says, I will come and bring my rule and reign back to creation. I won't leave it like this. And that's what Matthew's gospel is about at its core. It's about God becoming king once again and his kingdom coming on earth as in heaven, restoring blessing and life and joy to everything everywhere. That's the story we're entering into in Matthew's gospel. It's just a quick trip through Matthew uh, to see how he highlights this theme. We see that at Jesus' birth, very early on um, in the birth narrative, wise men show up who come from the east because they saw a star that, that directed them to a king. There's a new king that's been born. We've got to go and see him. They bring gifts to lay before this king and they find the child Jesus And they lay their gifts before him as the newborn king. 
And when this child grows up, he begins his public ministry with this announcement. Repent, for the kingdom is here. Matthew 4, 17. And then just a few verses later, Matthew tells us that Jesus went around Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. He's proclaiming the kingdom. And then he's showing what that kingdom looks like as he begins to restore and make what's broken whole again. This is what it looks like when God's rule and reign come. Things are made right again. As we continue through Matthew's gospel, we come to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. This uh, teaching of Jesus about the upside down nature of God's kingdom. So different from the kingdoms of the world. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches his followers to pray. God, let your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. And then he offers himself as the fulfillment to that prayer. As he moves into regions where sin and suffering have come to rule. Where death and despair reign. And he brings healing and forgiveness and life. These are the incredible stories of Matthew 8 and 9. Where Jesus begins to bring his kingdom on earth. To show this is what it looks like when God takes charge again. The broken is restored. Things are made right again. Joy breaks out. Many of Jesus' parables, as we come to Matthew 13, begin like this. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then he'll talk about a farmer sowing seed in a field, or leaven being kneaded into a a dough of some dough of bread or or a mustard seed that grows into a tree and spreads out its branches so that the birds of the air can find rest in it. He says, this is what the kingdom of heaven's like. And Matthew then leads us to the climax of his gospel where Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem. He comes in riding on a colt, a king coming into his city. The people are all there lined up shouting, Hosanna to the coming king, laying down palm branches and their coats because they know the king has come to be enthroned. But then, shockingly, he's arrested. He's beaten. He's crucified. It doesn't go the way the crowds were expecting. But Matthew wants us to see that Jesus going to the cross is, in fact, going to his enthronement. The king is being enthroned on the cross. And so he he goes to the cross wearing a crown of thorns on his head and they put a sign over him bearing more truth than the rulers of his day realized. It said, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. He has been enthroned on the cross where he takes the rule and reign back again by defeating death defeating Satan, defeating sin. And Matthew's gospel then closes with the resurrected Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, commissioning his disciples, saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me now. I am king. I have all authority. So go and make disciples of all nations. Go and bring the good news of this kingdom everywhere you go. Invite others to come out of the kingdoms of darkness, the kingdoms of this world, into the beautiful kingdom of light and life and joy that I have come to bring back to God's world. For Matthew, the gospel is all about a story that began in Genesis with the creation of the world that's now coming to its climax in Jesus the Messiah. God has become king once more in Jesus. That's what Matthew is telling us. And this morning, we're going to look at that um, announcement of Jesus' kingship um, in one particular, from one particular angle. Um, Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. That's where we're going to be together. And we're going to look at Jesus as the shepherd king together. Matthew 9, verse 35. I'm going to begin there. 
Matthew tells us that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. This is almost a word-for-word repeat of what Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 4, 23. We just looked at that a minute ago. Jesus goes around preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing diseases and afflictions. What Matthew's doing here, he's giving us two bookends. Begins in Matthew 4 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And now at the end of Matthew chapter 9, he's summarizing for us again what he's just told us in this section of the gospel. Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom and then he's demonstrating the good news of the kingdom by healing and bringing the kingdom into lives. So Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, tells of the new way of the kingdom, the new way he's calling his disciples into, the way of the kingdom of heaven that's different from all the kingdoms of the world. And then he heals people. He restores life to them, life like it's meant to be in God's kingdom. That's Matthew 8 and 9, the stories that John Lynch told us last week as Jesus goes and heals every disease and every affliction, fulfilling what the prophets foretold. One of my favorite chapters of the Bible has come to be Isaiah 35. That's only in the last couple of months. As I was reading through Isaiah in my Bible reading plan, I just fell in love with Isaiah all over again. Some people refer to Isaiah as the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah. This prophet speaking 700 years before the gospel writers, but proclaiming the coming king who's going to come and restore all things. And and Isaiah 35 is this beautiful chapter. I want to give you just a few uh, verses out of this because this is what Matthew's telling us Jesus is doing. So Isaiah 35 verse 4, he says, Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. That's exactly what we're seeing unfold in Matthew. God is coming to save. Jesus is proclaiming, the kingdom's here. The king has come. And then he's bringing that kingdom as he heals and restores and gives life back to the people. This is what it looks like when God becomes king. And Matthew is telling us about a king that's so different from the kings of this world that we know. We we live in a time, it's not unusual because it's been like this through all of history, when the kings of the world just have a tendency to abuse their power. You can't quite trust their authority because of how they use others for their own sake. But Jesus is the good king that we've longed for. There are a couple of remarkable things that Matthew tells us in in chapter 9 about him that I don't want us to miss. They're, They're small things that are easy to overlook. But in in verse 36 of Matthew 9, After telling us that Jesus is going around proclaiming the kingdom, healing, Matthew then says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Take note of this simple statement. When he saw the crowds, he saw the crowds. And not like I tend to see crowds, not like A lot of nameless, faceless people that stand between me and getting out of Walmart, right? That's how I tend to see the crowds. Jesus actually saw the crowds. He saw the people. He saw each person. That's what Matthew wants us to know here. He's highlighted this throughout Matthew 8 and 9. Uh, If I could just highlight these places for you so, so we don't miss This wonderful thing about our king. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, Matthew tells us when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother in law lying sick with fever. He didn't have to see her, 
She was just the mother-in-law off in a sick bed somewhere. Jesus had really important things to do, but he saw her. He saw her and he had something for her. Matthew chapter 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. He saw him. He didn't have to see him. This is just a tax collector. Everybody else tries to walk around, avoid, not catch his eye. Jesus saw him because he had something for him. Matthew 9.22, Jesus turned and seeing her, this woman in a crowd, as Jesus is on his way to heal somebody, he's got a mission, she just reaches out and touches the robe of his garment, and it says Jesus turned and saw her. He didn't have to. He could have kept on going. He had important matters to take care of, but he saw her. He had something for her. And then in Matthew 9.36, the verses we just read, When Jesus saw the crowds, he saw them. I read an article this week by a lady who, um, she works in a restaurant, she's in the service industry, and she was writing about how she understands, this is a calling from God for her, but it's a hard calling some days, a thankless job. And she says this, she says, there have been days where the second I walk into work, I want to leave. My colleagues and I are yelled at, we're disrespected, treated merely as vessels to obtain desires. Not many people look at us at all, let alone look into our eyes. You'd be amazed at how few interact with us as if we're human beings. Jesus didn't rush past people in a hurry to get on with his to-do list, only interested if you had something to offer him. He saw the crowds. He saw each one. He sees you. That's what Matthew wants us to to understand about our king this morning. He sees us with all our hurts and our needs, all our hopes and our longings. He sees. He knows. Don't miss this wonderful thing about our king, that he sees and he knows you. He saw the crowds, Matthew says, And he had compassion for them. That's remarkable thing number two. He had compassion on the crowds. In any crowd of people, even if it's just a crowd of one made up of you or made up of me, you're going to find a lot of messiness, quirks, anxieties, hopes, fears, dreams, disappointments, shame, weaknesses and struggles. It's all part of it. When Jesus sees this crowd, he he sees all of it. When he sees us, he sees all of it. And Matthew tells us his deepest gut level response, which is what the word compassion in Greek means. It refers to in his bowels. What he felt. It's an ancient way of talking about what comes from the deepest parts of someone. Jesus, at his heart, feels compassion for us, for you. You're not just lost to him, not just a face in the crowd. He sees you and where you feel most ashamed, where you feel most like hiding, most unsure of what you would find were you to look into his eyes and see him looking back at you. What? What kind of expression would would he have on his face? Well, Matthew gives us a pretty good idea. Compassion, tenderness. He feels deeply what you feel, and he cares for you. The last couple of times I've gotten to be with you, gotten to preach, um, I I always include a quote from, from this wonderful little book that has been an encouragement to me called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland And... um, So I've got a quote for you again this morning. Uh, I'm going to keep sharing them until everybody's gotten the book and read it, okay? Uh, So Dane Ortland says this. He says, the cumulative testimony of the four Gospels is that when Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of the world all about him, his deepest impulse, his most natural instinct is to move toward that sin and suffering, not away from it. He moves toward us in our weakness, in our sin, in our suffering, not away from us. Isn't that different from how we tend to think about Jesus? So much of my life I've thought, it's my sin 
that repulses him, makes him move away from me. That's not what we read in the scriptures. Matthew's just shown us throughout chapters 8 and 9 that Jesus moves toward lepers. He moves towards those who are tormented by demons so that they're uh, monstrous in how they're acting and he draws near to them. He moves toward Matthew, a tax collector, a sinner of sinners. He sees each one. He has compassion. He touches them. He heals them. He frees them. He loves them. He comes near to them to give them their life back. So we have to draw the conclusion, as Dane Ortland does in, in the book, that if the actions of Jesus are reflective of who he most deeply is, we cannot avoid the conclusion that it's the very fallenness which he came to undo that is most irresistibly attractive to him. That's incredible. That's scandalous. That Jesus is actually irresistibly drawn to us in our weakness. In the things that we most want to cover up and hide, that we're most ashamed of, he most wants to enter in there and say, let me in there. I'm not ashamed of you. Let me meet you there. I am drawn to you. You are irresistibly attractive to me in the place that you think is most unattractive to me. Let me meet you there. That's incredible. He had compassion for them, Matthew tells us. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. Two words that I think capture our condition so well. Um, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Like sheep who need a shepherd. So think with me just about this harassed and helplessness that we all experience for a minute. Um, there's all the physical weaknesses and torments and sicknesses and disease and afflictions that we, we carry with us. Harassed and helpless. Jesus saw the crowds. He saw it all. There's our addictions and our struggles with sin and all the resulting shame and the feelings of defeat. We feel. He sees. We're harassed. We're helpless. There are the fears and the anxieties that grab hold of our lives and choke the breath out of us. He sees it. He knows. We have wounds and pain that we carry from past hurts. Things that have been done to us. Things we've done to others. That we don't know how to heal from. We don't know how to fix what's broken. We just know we carry it with us. There's strained relationships and longings for love and loneliness and sadness and disappointments from the failures of love in our lives. And then just the day-to-day -day stuff that comes at us that, that you're just going about your day and you get knocked down. And then you get back up again and you get knocked down again. And you think, could I get back up one more time? And you get knocked right back down. And it's all the things that come at us. Harassed and helpless. Can you find yourself in the crowd? Do you see yourself among these sheep? Helpless and harassed, needing a shepherd. When I was in college, I was really impacted by a man named Rich Mullins. Uh, Rich was a Christian singer, a songwriter. He's, he's probably most well known for his song, Our God is an Awesome God, which is a great song. It's one of my least favorites of his. I, he has so many others that are so wonderful. Uh, but that's the one that, that made him most famous, I think. Uh, Rich was killed in a car accident, 1997. Um, he was only in his 40s. And, uh, and I didn't discover his music until shortly after he had been killed. I, I came to college right after that, got introduced to his music, and then, um, and then began to hear teachings of his. And at concerts, he would, in between songs, just speak about the love of God in a way that made you think, maybe it could be true. So he impacted my life in a really important way. 
Um, this is the 25th anniversary of Rich's death. And when I was in Brazil just a few weeks ago, my family, they had a, a tribute concert for Rich. And uh, it was live streamed. And so my family bought tickets to it. And they watched the live stream of the concert, which made me really happy for my kids to get to hear about Rich and, and hear his music. But it also made me a little jealous that I couldn't be there with them. Um, but it was Rich's honesty about his messiness, the messiness of his life. He had issues paired with his trust that God was compassionate and kind, that God actually loved him deeply, that gave me hope. As a college student with my own struggles and wrestlings, it gave me hope. Maybe that could be true for me too. And Rich's band was called uh, the Ragamuffin Band, Rich Mullins and the Ragamuffin Band. Um, they took their name from a book by a guy named Brennan Manning. Some of you may have heard of Brennan Manning, who wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. Rich had gotten a hold of Brennan Manning's teachings, listened to some tapes, had read the book about this ragamuffin gospel, this gospel that's for ragamuffins, for messy, broken people. That's who the gospel's for. And it flipped Rich's life upside down. So I was listening to some Rich Mullins music a few weeks ago. Um, just put some Rich Mullins music on and my kids were... Uh, listening with me and and in between some of the songs there would be rich talking about the love of God and there was one place where he started talking and I I listened and then I paused it and I, I went back on YouTube back to the beginning and to listen again and to listen and my kids are like what are you doing dad I'm like ah, I'm writing this down like I just need I just needed that truth so these are the words that I was listening to he was describing what the ragamuffin gospel is. And he says this, ragamuffin gospel is that thing where you go, let's not all pretend like we're all great. Let's say that the pressure's off, that you don't have to have it all together. Let's meet God and allow God to meet us where we are. Maybe I'm confused. Maybe I'm scared. Maybe I'm beat down. Maybe I'm a lot of things. That does not change the character of God. That does not change the love that God has for me. That does not change the fact that he longs to be compassionate. God meets us at the point of our need. That's what we see here, what Matthew's telling us. As we watch Jesus in the pages of this gospel, it's the king coming full of compassion to meet us at the point of our need. Rich has a line in one of my favorite songs of his. The song's called Hard to Get. And the line goes like this. He says, I'm reeling from these voices that keep screaming in my ears. All the words of shame and doubt, blame and regret. I can't see how you're leading me unless you've led me here to where I'm lost enough to let myself be led. That's what it feels like to be harassed and helpless. All these voices screaming in my head, and I feel lost, and I don't know the way out. And Jesus looks on the crowds. He sees. He looks on us, this crowd, and he knows. And he comes to be our shepherd. Jesus has come to lead us in our lostness. He's come to be our shepherd. From the time of King David, you remember King David, the shepherd boy who became king over God's people? Um, Shepherd language has come to be tied with kingship in the Bible. Um, so David himself uh, famously wrote Psalm 23, this great psalm that resonates with people um, through the ages all across the world. Psalm 23 about the Lord who is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's he who leads me through uh, green pastures and beside still waters. He in, in a field surrounded by enemies is preparing a feast for me, saying, you're safe. I'm here with you as your shepherd, right? Psalm 23, this image of God sovereignly caring for us, it just resonates with us because that's what good kings do. That's what we long for, a king like that. And what we find in the Old Testament is something very different. We find kings that do the opposite of that, um, Ezekiel 34 is a chapter in the Old Testament. The prophet Ezekiel speaking um, about the leaders of his day. 
And many commentators think that, that in these verses in Matthew's gospel about seeing the sheep harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, that, that Ezekiel 34, this prophecy, is what stands behind these words. So I want to read to you just a bit out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel tells us this, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost ones you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. But then God says, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 11 of Ezekiel 34. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they've been scattered. I will seek the lost. I'll bring back the strayed. I'll bind up the injured. And I will strengthen the weak. This is what the Lord says he will do for his lost sheep. And then he tells us how he will do this. In verse 22, he says, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. That's Jesus, the son of David. Matthew tells us in the opening of his gospel. Jesus, the Christ, the son of David. I will set up my servant David and he shall feed them. He will be their shepherd and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. God's people, harassed and helpless, not protected, not cared for by the leaders that should have cared for them and protected them, used and exploited, leading to pain, to death, to despair. God says, I will come and be king over them. I will rescue them. I will set my king over them to shepherd them. The picture is is one that... uh, I love to use when I'm teaching biblical theology in other places. I just talked with with a group in Brazil I was was with in September about the Lion King. It's a great, so many great, uh, great illustrations from Lion King. But one of my favorites is this, this picture of abundance and blessing and flourishing. When the movie opens, you guys know the opening scene, right? All the animals are coming. Everything's green and the animals are frolicking. They're happy. They're joyful. They're going to stand before Mufasa, the king where Simba, the prince that's just been born, is going to be presented to them. And there's joy, there's beauty, there's goodness, right? You have the picture? But then if you know the story, you know that Mufasa is killed by his brother, Scar. Simba flees, and Scar takes over the kingdom. And what happens in the kingdom then? It all dries up. There's no food. Everything's dry. Everything green is gone. Right? It's a picture of life under shepherds who exploit and use. It's what happens when sin and Satan and death come to rule in God's good world. But all through the Old Testament, God speaks of a coming day when he's going to come back as king. He's going to bring blessing and life back to his world. And so in The Lion King, that happens when Simba returns to the Pride Lands. He overthrows Scar and he restores green, blessing, joy to the kingdom, right? This is what we see happening in Matthew's gospel. 
The king has returned. And he's bringing life back to his people. So Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men come and they say, where's the king, where's the king that's been born? And, and they look back in the prophecies of the Old Testament and they say, well, well, check in Bethlehem because there's this prophecy from Micah that says, you, O Bethlehem, you are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's what we're seeing unfold in Matthew's gospel. Jesus has come to be king. He's come to shepherd God's people. And he's redefining what kingship looks like. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He sees where we're harassed and helpless. And he stands in the middle of it all with us. He enters into our harassed and helpless condition. And he says, I'll take it on myself, on the cross. I'll go up against everything that stands against you. I'll bear your sin. I'll bear your shame. I'll take on death and Satan, and sin, and I will overthrow them. And I will lead you into green pastures. On the cross, he deals with it all. And he rises from the dead and declares, all authority is mine now. There's a new king in town. And things are going to begin to look different in a really wonderful way. That's the king and his kingdom. And so, now you, the sheep, go and make disciples of all nations. Right? That's where the gospel ends. This great commission. Go out and bring this good news everywhere. And that's what we see Matthew doing in chapter 9 here. Jesus looks on the crowds with compassion. He sees they're harassed and helpless like sheep needing a shepherd. And he says to his disciples, pray. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray for God to raise up laborers who will go out to those who are harassed and helpless, who will tell them of the shepherd king, that he's come to rescue them, that he laid his life down for them, that he took it up again in order to give them life and life to the full. One more place in Matthew's gospel where he talks about the sheep and the shepherd. It comes later in the gospel in Matthew chapter 25. And I think it's instructive for us as to what we're seeing here in Matthew 9. Because it's where Jesus says at the end of time will separate, separate the sheep of the goat and the goats. Like a shepherd separates his sheep out. And then he'll declare to the sheep. He'll say, come you who are blessed of my father because I was hungry. And you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you took me in. And, and the sheep will say, Lord, when did, when did we do that? And he'll say, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Right? We find in that passage what sheep who have been cared for by the shepherd do. They go and they see others who are harassed and helpless. They go and they bring compassion to those in need and they meet their needs because they've met the shepherd who has cared for them and met them in their need and so now they're learning to go and meet others in their need. If that's what Jesus is calling us to. Pray for God to raise up laborers and then go and see the crowds. See the person in front of you. See them as someone in need of the shepherd and you get to take them by the hand and say, I know the shepherd. I'll take you to the good shepherd. I don't know the way out of what you're going through, but he does. He's come to meet you in the place of your need. Invite them to meet the king and enter into the goodness of his kingdom. I want to close this morning with, a, with an exercise that I want us to do. This series is all about encountering Jesus. right? Not just knowing more about him, not just understanding the gospel of Matthew better. Those things are wonderful. But it's through the gospel of Matthew we're meant to encounter Jesus. That's what, that's what this series has been about. And uh, so I want to do an exercise with us. I know Kim Stewart, the first week of the series, led us in a time of Lectio Divina. 
Um, this is a similar kind of activity that I want to walk us through. Uh, we're going to use Psalm 23 as, as our text for meditating on the good king who's our shepherd. We're going to do this twice with us, okay? We're going to, uh, once for ourselves and once for others that we know that are in need. So, if you would... If you do this with me, if you feel comfortable, uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to imagine yourself in a field. You're a sheep in a big field with enemies surrounding you. You can see on the edges of the field the wolves, and they're beginning to come in to stalk their prey. And there you stand helpless in the middle of the field. I want you to think about what the wolves are for you this morning. The things that make you feel vulnerable, afraid, confused, and ashamed. What are the hurts? What are the the broken places in your life right now? What are the things that feel too big for you where you say, I don't know how to get through this. I don't know my way through. Now I want you to picture Jesus walking toward you off on the edge of the field and he's coming to you. But he's coming with a fierceness in his step. His eyes are locked on yours. He sees you and he's coming for you to protect you. He's coming to rescue you. He's coming to take on all the enemies that are surrounding you and to prepare a feast for you right in the middle of that field to say, you're safe. This is a place of abundance because I'm here. I'm gonna turn this for good in your life. Now I want you to just hear these words, these promises for all who trust in him. I want you to receive them as your reality this morning. Receive them into those places of your life where you are harassed and helpless. Hear these words from the king. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are the words of the shepherd king to you today. In all those places of your life where you feel harassed and helpless, these are his words to you. This is his promise to you. He stands with you in the middle of it. You can trust him. You can go back to these words from Psalm 23 and hold on to them as your truth. He's with you and he's seeing you through. Because this passage from Matthew 9, though, turns from his care for us to him then sending us out to care for others. I want to to go through Psalm 23 once more, but I want to do that for someone else in your life this morning. I want you to think about someone that you know. Maybe it's a family member, a friend, a coworker. Someone you know, someone you care about that you know, they're, they're in a hard place. They're going through some things where they feel lost, where they feel discouraged, where uh, whatever it may be in their life, it, it's too big for them. They need a shepherd. And I just want us to, uh, to speak these words to them on their behalf by faith as a declaration that they have a shepherd who cares for them. He knows the way through. 
He's the one that can meet them and lead them into the beauty that he is preparing for them. And so hold that person in your heart as we speak these words together from Psalm 23 again. I'll speak them over us. And you hold that person in your heart and and make this your prayer for them and your words speaking to them as a declaration over them. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside still waters. He restores your soul. He leads you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for he's with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. He is preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil. Your cup will overflow. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You have a shepherd king who loves you, who sees you, who has compassion on you. He is your shepherd. You shall not want This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of our shepherd king. Amen and amen.